So, Kathleen, we tasked you with a big one today. Not just what's worth watching this weekend, but what is worth watching this summer. So you're starting with a pick that I remember you telling us to look out for months ago. It is here. I have seen it. The Broadway musical In the Heights, the adaptation for film. What did you think? Okay, so first I'm going to break down the movie, and then I'm going to break down the controversy. Uh So, Tracy, you've seen it. I saw it on Broadway years and years and years ago with the original cast. So this music and these songs and this story mean a lot to me. And I want to tell you all that before I get to the controversy because I did really enjoy this movie. Mm -hmm. So it follows Usnavi, played by the very dreamy Anthony Ramos. And he is a bodega owner who has these dreams of going back to his father's home country of the Dominican Republic. But he lives in this neighborhood, the predominantly Latinx neighborhood of Washington Heights in New York City. And when somebody in their community wins the lottery of 96,000, I promise that song, 96,000 will be in your head by the end of the movie, (laughs) things unfold from there. So this movie is supposed to be this love letter to Washington Heights and to the Latinx people of that community. And so, again, I really enjoyed the film, but here's where we get to the controversy. It does the Broadway musical justice, but it doesn't necessarily do the community that lives in Washington Heights justice. Because, as I'm sure you noticed from the clips that we're showing from the movie, even if you haven't seen it, all of the lead roles, with one exception, uh, Corey Hawkins, who plays Benny, they're all light-skinned or white-passing Latinx people. And that is not an accurate representation of the real Washington Heights. And so this has brought up a larger conversation about colorism in Hollywood and how often darker-skinned actors get passed over for roles that they should have. And now this controversy has been, you know, pushed aside. This criticism has been um, likened to being canceled or attacks on Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I really just want to say that that's not what it is. This is valid critiques of a film that is very good, but could have been better. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk of just wait wait for the next one for there to be more accurate representation or for there not to be colorism. But we won't get to the next one unless we point out what is wrong with this one. So I just want to say that two things can be true. Two things can be true. I can recommend this movie and tell you that I loved it and also say that everyone involved should have done better and should moving forward. You know what, KNB, I will say this. uh, We need to leave room for nuance. And I feel that the world of social media has in many ways become very much a binary, a dichotomy. It's like yes or bad, wrong or right, good or bad. We need some nuance. We need some flavor. We need to be able to critique um, without saying throw the whole thing out. So respect. I respect that for sure. The next one up uh, is for the whole family. So Space Jam 2, a live action animated sports comedy film directed by Malcolm D. Lee. What are your thoughts? Okay, this may just be my nostalgia talking, but Space Jam, A New Legacy was my most highly anticipated movie of summer 2021. (laughs) I grew up with the original. It's 25 years later since the Michael Jordan played um, himself in Space Jam. And now we've got the new goat of basketball. I said what I said. LeBron James (laughs) is starring in this. And the story follows him and his son as they get trapped in this digital space with a villain played by Don Cheadle, because why not? And um, they meet up with the Looney Tunes, who are going to try to help them get out of this space. And of course, like in the original, some of our favorite NBA stars will be making cameos. It's the Looney Tunes versus the goons all over again, even more epic. I'm also very excited for the soundtrack because I listen to the soundtrack Mm -hmm. every day with my big brothers for years. Oh, that's so adorable. I'm putting it on the list for my family for sure. Like, that's a good one. So super excited to see the next one as well. We finally get to see the backstory of Natasha Romanoff and get to know this Marvel character better in Black Widow. Tell us more. Okay, so if you have been on the Marvel tip for about a decade, like I have. You've watched all the movies, you know all the characters. You have to watch Black Widow. 
So Scarlett Johansson as Natasha Romanoff has been this lone lead woman in the Avengers for so long. And now she finally is getting the spotlight all on her. This is the first standalone movie in the MCU that focuses on a female hero. So this follows Natasha as she is recruited by birth from the KGB and as they groom her to become this killer assassin. Um, it is getting incredible reviews. I'm really excited for it. And again, if you love the MCU, you gotta give Natasha her love. Absolutely. Okay, this next film is Zola. It looks super trippy and wild, Kathleen. Tell us why we should watch this one. <laughs> it is super trippy and wild. So this is some counter-programming for you. This is not a summer blockbuster packed with, you know, flashy animated characters or superheroes or heroes, but I promise you it is worth your time. So Zola is the first movie based on a Twitter thread. It is based on the 148 character viral thread by Asia King, also known as Zola. And she was a waitress from Detroit who took to Twitter to tell this slightly exaggerated but true story of how her and her friend fell out, as she says. So mm. it stars Taylor Page as Zola, who is a revelation, and Riley Keough as Stephanie, this friend who convinces Zola to go to a party with her in Florida for a weekend, and that what ends up happening is this wild journey uh, involving a pimp, played by Coleman Domingo, who's one of my favorite actors, a clueless boyfriend, played by Nicholas Braun of Succession fame, and some drug dealers in Tampa. Even if you haven't read the very insane Twitter feed, which you should, uh, you are in for a ride of twists, turns, suspense, and you know that I love, Tracy, you know that I love works by black women directors. And this was directed by Janixa Brava. And she brings this story to life in a way that I didn't think was possible. You think, oh, a movie based on a Twitter thread. That can't be good. I promise you, it's so good. That's insane. Based on a Twitter thread? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so we're completely out of time, but we're going to keep going. So let's go through these last two a little bit quickly. We've got F9, The Fast okay, okay, okay. Saga. So what is your take on this one? I, 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 can't, I don't have to say a lot about F9 because <laughs> summer is always better when there is a Fast and the Furious franchise movie. This is the follow-up to the one that came out in uh, 2017. This is the 10th film in the franchise Dominic Toretto is trying to live a quiet life with Letty, but you know, for the Toretto's, there is no quiet life. Okay, Aubrey, S-B-E-C-T, we got to talk about this, the Aretha Franklin <laughs> biopic, so I'm very much looking forward to this one. Tell us a bit about it. I feel like I only need to say two words, Jennifer Hudson. Mm. She plays Aretha Franklin, mm -hmm. and actually before Aretha passed, she co-signed this, she gave Jennifer her blessing, this is obviously, we know, huge shoes to fill, but Aretha threw her proverbial shoes at Jennifer Hudson and said, <laughs> take it, run with it. And I know that if anyone can pull this off, it's J-Hud. I am here for all the shoe throwing. Absolutely. We pour one out for Aretha, <laughs> man. Thank you so much, KNB.